warm welcome to everyone and especially to our speaker for today our speaker for today is ben mol from lse and he is going to talk to us about a very important topic uneven growth uh, automation's impact on income and wealth inequality so ben will speak for 30 minutes then loha kalve from edhec we'll discuss the paper for 30 minutes and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions uh, from the audience if you can turn on your videos uh, it will be very nice so that we can see each other and feel that we are almost back to a normal setup where we can have regular seminars so with that uh, ben the floor is all yours excellent thank you uh, very much um really really great to be here and uh you know to connect with this uh, uh somewhat different group than the usual sort of macro crowd i hang out with so i'm really uh, keen to to uh you know looking forward to this conversation so this is work with um uh, lucas rachel who was on the job market i guess last year is doing a postdoc at princeton now and is going to ucl and pasquale restrepo at uh boston university um okay so our starting point is that so sort of in the last 40 years in many developed countries we've seen a, a, a sort of empirical pattern that one may call sort of unevenly distributed economic growth here's a, a graph to show you this for the united states um and this is the income distribution for the united states over time so time on the x axis different percentiles of the income distribution here and you know what you obviously see is that basically the percentiles corresponding to the bottom of the distribution have basically um stagnated over time while uh at the top of the distribution um there there has been much more growth in the in the top percentiles and if you look you know further into the top of the distribution say the 99th percentile that's even more pronounced okay so you know obviously there's a question you know where this where this comes from what explains this and there's a huge literature that argues that technology so technological change uh may affect wage inequality um and examples of this are the literature on skill bias technological change and the polarization of wages for example but you know not all income is labor income uh capital income is also important in the data particularly at the top of the distribution where we've seen the largest increases in these incomes as i've just shown you um so you know what about uh, uh capital income uh, uh and then also wealth i guess you may wonder about um which is ultimately what the capital income is derived from i guess so here's what we're going to do here in this paper so we're going to build a tractable framework um to study how technology determines uh, not just the distribution of labor incomes but more generally the distribution of total income so including capital income and the wealth distribution okay and then we're going to use it to examine the distributional effects of automation technologies um meaning in particular technologies that substitute uh, labor for capital in production so think about uh, uh robots and so on i'll give some more concrete examples later um here's i guess our main argument in a nutshell and that argument is that um technology doesn't only affect uh relative wages like in the standard uh you know labor theories but technology may also uh, affect returns to wealth and that may then have distributional consequences okay um in our particular theory um uh, it's sort of going to be an analytical model as i said there's a there's a very simple um, but also somewhat specific version of this uh the way it's going to work out is uh in there's going to be one sort of uh, common return to wealth in the in the baseline theory and then the way it's going to look is basically um uh if you're familiar with the neoclassical growth model the return to wealth is going to have the same formula as in a standard neoclassical growth model so the the discount rate plus then ha something having to do with long run growth but then there's going to be an additional term okay and this additional term is going to uh have something to do with automation more precisely there's going to be this sort of a return premium here um which is going to depend uh on the capital share in the economy and that capital share is also as we're going to show going to be the right measure uh uh that summarizes sort of how much automation 
there's been uh, in this economy. Okay, so you can see, uh, and so this is an increasing function. So returns to wealth are going to be increasing if automation and the capital share increase. Okay? Um, this is then going to have immediately a bunch of distributional consequences of automation. So there's going to be, um, you know, first of all, a, a result, a, a distributional effect via wages. Okay, not just via relative wages, but via the level of wages. In particular, what's going to happen in this uh, economy is that, um, you know, rather than investment increasing a lot when there's uh, uh, automation, what's instead going to happen is uh, some of this uh, increase in, in, in automation is going to show up in returns to wealth. Um, and that's going to, on the flip side of it, show up as uh, stagnant wages at the bottom of the uh, wage of the income distribution. Another way of saying this is basically, so this automation is going to uh, generate some productivity gains, not very small ones, but there are going to be uh, productivity gains. But then the way it's going to work is rather than these productivity gains accruing to workers, which is what would happen in standard theories, here instead, these productivity gains are going to accrue uh, at least partly to owners of capital. Okay, And I'll explain this in more detail. What's going to be very important here is basically the elasticity of capital supply. So, you know, how much uh, when, when you have a rightward shift to the of the capital demand curve, how much of that is going to show up as an increase in the quantity of capital and how much of that is going to show up uh, uh, in an increase in the, you know, return to the capital. Okay. Then a, a, a second effect that that's going to be there in our model. Uh, uh, and, you know, that effect up here, that's mostly important at the bottom of the income distribution. This effect here is going to be mostly important at the top of the uh, income distribution is going to be via wealth accumulation. Okay, And essentially what's going to happen is because automation increases these returns to wealth, uh, according to this formula up here, uh, what's going to happen is that some people who already have some wealth, uh, so who, who own uh, you know, part of the capital that's getting more productive due to automation, they're going to be able to accumulate large fortunes. This is going to come up in a very simple way in, in this theory. So in particular, both the income and wealth distributions are going to have Pareto tails like in the data. And uh, the fatness of these Pareto tails is going to be increasing uh, in the capital share of the economy. Okay, uh, So there's going to be a link between factor income distribution and personal income distribution. So when the capital share uh, goes up, the personal income and wealth distribution is going to be, get more dispersed. Okay. So one thing um, that you know you're, you're probably going to think in your mind is sort of you know I told you that when automation increases, returns to wealth uh, are, are going to increase. So you may wonder, you know, but what about empirical uh, uh, trends of for returns uh, that we've observed over the the last forty years? Okay, and in particular, one one return trend that you may have in the back of your mind is that obviously returns on safe assets. Uh, Sort of say uh, government bonds um, have been on a secular declining trend. Okay, and indeed, you know this is a, this red line here uh, is exactly meant to show you this. Okay, however, there's also other ways of measuring sort of returns at the economy-wide level, uh, uh, and if you do other things or look at other assets, I guess um, this isn't true. And you know other assets have actually uh, displayed increasing trends. Here is, for example, one way macro people like to do this. This is sort of a, a measure of the return to uh, the overall uh, uh, capital in the US economy. And basically what you do is you just go to the national income and product accounts and you measure uh, uh, sort of total uh, GDP and then you, or capital income, I guess is the more, more uh, the simpler way. And then you uh, divide that by just the measure of the capital stock. And if you do that, uh, then you actually get an increasing line. Now, there's obviously a question and, um, you know, which of these uh, two returns should you be looking at? Um, in the baseline model, we only have, uh, you know, one return. So there's, it's a one asset model. So you can't really talk about that in a meaningful way. But then uh, in a later section of the paper that I'll hopefully get to, we have a model with two assets in particular, a risky asset and a safe asset, where you can then talk about in a meaningful way about this sort of diverging trend. Okay, uh, And then what turns out to be the right thing to look at is basically um, an average return to wealth. So in particular, if you have different assets, sort of, uh, uh, you know, a weighted average 
of the different returns on the different assets with the weights given by the portfolio shares. Okay? And it turns out that uh, you know, that green line is basically closer, we think, to, to the right thing to look at uh, in the data than the, than the red line there, which is just uh, you know, the return on a particular asset, so these safe assets. Furthermore, um, you know, what matters for wealth inequality in our model, um, uh, and you could sort of see that on the formula I showed uh, a slide ago, what matters for wealth inequality is not the return to wealth, it's really the return to wealth relative to uh, uh, you know, people's discount rate and some uh, uh, term here that's due to the economy growing. So in particular, this sort of return premium here. So how much of a gap is there um, you know, between this return to wealth uh, and, and this sort of baseline measure of return to wealth? Uh, why? Because that's gonna determine the speed at which people are gonna accumulate wealth in our model. Okay? And if you do that, so in particular, if you try to subtract, um, you know, of uh, uh, some something that takes into account how much the economy is growing, then in fact, um, you know, because obviously economic growth has declined over time, um, you know, you can see that uh, definitely these return series have been increasing over time. Okay? Uh, so even the safe return decline is not that large, and if you look at sort of at, at matters of average returns, those those have been increasing. I'll come back to this. Okay. Just briefly to uh, talk about, uh, about our contribution to the literature. So there's obviously a, a literature that talks about automation and inequality in particular. Uh, my co-author Pasquale uh, with the Ron Asimoglu has a bunch of papers. Here's, a, here's a, a bunch of other references. Again, here the key contribution relative to that literature is that we talk not just about wage inequality, so labor incomes, but instead capital income and wealth. Okay. Uh, more generally, there's a, uh, there is some literature that links technological change to changes in the wealth distribution. Here's some references for that. Um, the standard mechanism in that literature is basically, again, that sort of technology affects relative wages. And then, you know, because relative wages change, say wage dispersion increases, that affects wealth inequality. Relative to that literature, we have this sort of new mechanism, which is that there's this effect uh, going through returns to wealth, which is absent in the existing literature. Again, so technology changes uh, uh, returns to wealth or the distribution of returns to wealth and that affects wealth inequality. Okay. Um, here's the plan uh, for the talk. I'm gonna show you uh, this framework here. Um, I'll mostly focus on the steady state then where you can see lots of things. And then we're gonna take the model to the data. Okay. Um, we're gonna calibrate how much automation there is in some way and then try to see how much of this uneven growth is gonna get us. Okay. Just to already preview this, um, this is the type of uh, 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 graph I'll show you coming out of um, uh, our calibrated model. So essentially what I'm gonna try to convince you of is that um, automation here is gonna lead to relatively small aggregate productivity gains, okay? But at the same time, it can lead to large distributional effects, okay? So what's on this graph here, again, that's something that comes out of our model and we'll compare it to the data then later as well. So this is like say income percentile on the, on the x-axis, and then it's a change in income percentiles from one steady state to the next on the, on the y-axis. Um, you know, for comparison, uh, you know, just to get you a sense of how much action you get in this model, the green line is essentially what would happen in a, a representative household model. Uh, uh, and basically what you can see, nothing much would happen to the distribution uh, in a representative household model. Okay, um, but then the black line essentially is what happens in our model um, where you have these interesting channels uh, uh, going on. And you can see that basically you get large increases in inequality uh, in particular uh, driven by increases in in incomes at the top of the distribution. In contrast, the, the uh, you know, bottom of the distribution sees largely stagnant incomes just like in the data. So again, in a representative household model, basically everyone is better off Okay, so all these you know percentiles have income increases in the uh, our model. There's this very uneven growth. Um, you know, at the bottom there's stagnation. At the top there's huge increases. I'll show you where this comes from. It basically comes exactly from uh, the two channels I highlighted earlier. So at the bottom, um, basically these people only have labor incomes. Labor incomes stagnate. At the top, uh, these people have uh, some wealth and some capital income. And then basically when there's automation, returns to wealth increase and th these guys' capital income and uh, wealth increases. So basically there's sort of a 
double positive effect for these guys, their return to wealth increases, also the, their labor incomes increases, and there's a double negative uh, effect for these guys. So they don't, uh, their labor income stagnate, uh, uh, and they also don't have any wealth, so they don't benefit from these uh, increasing returns uh, uh, to wealth there. Okay, so um, let me show you the, the model and then, uh, you know, uh, show you the, the, the calibration um, and the, taking the model to the data. Okay, so it's a very simple stylized model um, that on purpose we built to keep things as tractable as possible because we wanted to, um, you know, uh, be able to have nice analytic results. Um, as a result, it's also going to make some very strong assumptions. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about these probably. Um, so, you know, uh, people have standard uh, sort of CRA utility, and here in the baseline model, just um, accumulate uh, uh, in one asset. So uh, essentially, the way this is going to work is um, Z here uh, denotes your skill type, and people have different wages according to their skill type. We're going to endogenize these in general equilibrium in a second. Um, and then um, S here uh, denotes basically just the time that's uh, evolved over time. And you can see, so there your saving equals your, your uh, capital income plus your labor income minus your consumption. So very standard one asset model. Okay. Now, this looks exactly like in a neoclassical growth model, right? So a standard model. We know that in that kind of a model, you know, not, not much interesting stuff happens. In fact, um, you know, if you, if you had, uh, 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 you know, just this type of a setup, it would actually um, uh, collapse to a neoclassical growth model in which the long run return to wealth would just be pinned down by the discount rate. And um, we're going to make um, an assumption to break this. Okay. This assumption is going to be quite stark, um, but it's going to, you know, in a very sort of tractable fashion, introduce a bunch of very interesting things. Okay. Uh, this assumption is going to be that when these people accumulate wealth, they're going to be subject to what we call wealth dissipation shocks. Okay. So the way this is going to work is you accumulate wealth according to this type of uh, 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 equation here, and then at some Poisson rate p, okay, you get hit by a wealth dissipation shock, which basically uh, means that your 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 wealth goes from whatever it is to zero, okay, and so your wealth just kind of dissipates, disappears, okay. Um, apart from that, you know everything's kind of standard, so people are, uh, 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 you know this discount at this effective discount rate and so on. Okay. So now you may ask what the hell is this type of a dissipation shock? Okay. We have a, a long discussion um, of this in the paper. Um, let me give you sort of the, tell you first what it does. Okay. So that what it does basically is it, it generates in a very simple way, a, a non-degenerate uh, wealth distribution. Okay. A, and second, an upward sloping long run supply of capital. I'll show you this later. Those are the two things we want to get out of this, okay? So it's really a stand in basically for lots of other mechanisms that could give you this, okay? Here's a list of them. I don't have time to go through this. There's a long discussion in the paper, um, but just to you know, t tell you about uh, uh, some of them. So in particular, I think this one, I like the last one here. Um, I think this is basically a reduced form for, uh, say, a model with capital income risk, the rate of return risk, um, uh, like in papers by, you know, Ben Abib and Bizin, for people who know this, this would uh, give, give you something that looks very similar. Here, it's an extreme form of capital income risk, where, you know, your capital return is minus 100%, basically, with some probability and positive otherwise. And we know that in the data, Laurent has some nice work on this, for example. We know that in the data, there's lots of... Uh, dispersion and rates of return, basically. And so this is a simple reduced form way of capturing this. Another thing is that whenever you set P equals zero, you get back the representative uh, uh, agent uh, benchmark. So basically all the formulas I'm going to show you, what you can always do is set P equals zero and you're back in the, uh, 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 in the representative household model. And you can sort of see exactly what, you know, what our little trick here adds relative to that. Okay. Apart from that, we basically now take this model that gives you a nice wealth distribution and we glue that together with a model of automation. This model of automation is uh, basically something that we have from the existing literature, in particular Pasquale's work with uh, Daron. Uh, there's also older papers by uh, Joseph, Joseph Serra. Um, it's a task-based model, okay, where the idea is that machines substitute for labor uh, uh, 
at the task level, okay? And then what automation is, it means automation means that uh, machines can do more tasks over time, okay? Um, so think about, um, you know, the, the, the recruiting process maybe, and there used to be, or there used to be HR workers who did uh, all of the tasks. Now, um, you know, a lot more is uh, uh, driven by software, for example. That would be the type of model. Um, okay. Apart from that, we're going to then nest this type of model in a relatively standard sort of multi-sector economy here. We're going to have the assumption that each skill sort of produces in a different sector. And then the aggregate GDP is sort of a Cobb-Douglas aggregate of these different sectors. And then within these sectors, again, there's this uh, task-based model. And then basically the way this is going to work, uh, and again, the details are in the paper, um, there's a parameter alpha um, that's specific to each sector Z uh, or each skill type Z, which is what's the share of tasks that's automated, okay? Um, and then basically automation is uh, uh, an increase in that alpha Z, okay? And the way this is gonna work, I'll show you this in, on the next slide, I think, is basically these task-based models of automations, the way they work is um, in the end, basically, um, at the sector level, there's going to be a reduced form production function that's just going to be a Cobb Douglas production function, you know, like k to the alpha z times l to the one minus alpha z, and then basically an increase in alpha z. Um, uh, is, so automation is just going to be an increase in alpha z, which is just an increase in the Cobb Douglas exponent of the economy. You can already see that's going to give some interesting things, like for example, uh, uh, an increase in the capital share and the decline in the labor share. Okay. Um, so exactly, so I've already said these things, I think. Um, so you can, on the production side, um, you know, aggregate things kind of nicely, um, and you're gonna end up with an aggregate production function um, that has uh, the aggregate capital stock here, and then something having to do with labor here. And there's basically gonna be a simple reduced form uh, parameter alpha here that summarizes exactly how much um, automation there has been, um, uh, which is sort of this weighted average here of these sector specific alphas. Okay, so that obviously comes from the fact that we assume that everything's sort of Cobb Douglas here. Um, and then basically you can see it as a one to one mapping between how much automation there's been and uh, what, the, what the capital share is in the economy. Okay? In particular, the factor payments here in this economy are going to be very simple. Um, so the, the return, the rental rate here. It's just a fraction alpha um, um, of uh, uh, GDP divided by capital. And you have your standard sort of uh, expressions basically like in a neoclassical growth model, say for, for the production side of the economy. Okay. I'll show you just because it makes the math slightly easier. Um, uh, equations for the special case where uh, depreciation is zero Okay, in which case the rental rate is going to be equal to the return to wealth here. Um, but, you know, that's not essential to uh, the results on the, I want to show you. So here comes the key thing, I guess. Um, so essentially, you can get a closed form solution for households consumption and saving decisions. Okay, um, you know, from that um, problem here two slides ago, you can see that, you know, this has a nice solution potentially. Um, and in particular, here is the key equation I want to focus on. Um, so that's an equation for wealth accumulation. And you can see that, um, you know, essentially this says savings equal to, you know, your standard Euler equation term here, basically um, the gap between the return to wealth minus the discount rate times the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. And then uh, uh, times, uh, this is what we call sort of people's effective wealth. So it's their financial wealth plus their human wealth. Okay, and you can see the relevant state variable here um, is, is going to be this effective wealth. So, you know, you, you don't just want to take into account financial wealth, you also want to take into account human wealth. Okay? Now, from this equation, you can pretty immediately derive uh, a, a simple equation for, um, you know, aggregate capital accumulation. So, the accumulation of total wealth. So, K here is just the sum of all the little A's. Okay. Um, and in particular, uh, uh, because of these wealth dissipation shocks, okay. You can see that um, uh, you know you can derive this sort of simple 
uh, uh, expression for the aggregate supply of capital that uh, comes from household saving in this economy. Okay. And I'll show you this on the next slide. This curve here, if you look at that as a function of the interest rate or the return to wealth here, is going to be an increasing function. Okay. So you have in this model a long run capital supply curve that's increasing with the interest rate as opposed to being perfectly elastic um, like it would be, say, in a neoclassical growth model. Okay. So here is essentially then how uh, you know, the, the determination of equilibrium works in the, uh, in the um, capital market. Okay, so this is capital on the x-axis, um, the interest rate, so the return to capital on the y-axis. Um, uh, you have your standard demand for capital. Demand for capital just comes from the marginal product of the firms. Okay? Uh, and this is this capital supply curve I just showed you. And the equilibrium here is the intersection of these two curves. Okay. So now let me show you basically um, how uh, automation works in this economy and what happens you know, with the return to wealth. Okay. And for comparison, it's useful to keep in mind that basically um, you know, if instead you had the case P equals zero, so you had this kind of a representative agent model, okay, then the long run supply of capital in this economy okay, um, would be you know, this um, um, perfectly elastic capital supply curve here uh, at interest rate equals to discount rate, okay? And the equilibrium would be the intersection of these two points here. Uh, instead, all we're basically saying is, hey, you know, maybe this assumption in a neoclassical growth model that the supply of capital is perfectly elastic is a little bit crazy. And maybe we should have an upward sloping capital supply curve uh, and, and, and then look at the equilibrium there. So five minutes then. Okay. This is really the key, like, the, the, you know, and if you want to have the key thing that's happening in our model in one slide, this is it. Uh, so, so basically, now let's think about an increasing in automation. Okay. Uh, again, I said automation means this alpha parameter goes up. Okay. Um, what automation does here is because capital became more productive. Um, it shifts this capital demand curve to the right. Okay. Now let's first think what would happen if you had a representative household model, okay, like a neoclassical growth model. Then what would happen with an increase in automation is you know, the, the capital demand curve shifts to the right here. You'd go from this equilibrium to this equilibrium. Um, in particular, the return to wealth would be unchanged, okay, uh, still equal to rho. And you'd have a huge expansion of capital in the economy. So a big inflow, uh, a big increase in investment, basically. Okay? In our model, instead, uh, that doesn't happen. Okay? Instead, because the capital supply curve is upward sloping, you have a much smaller increase in, uh, in the amount of capital. And instead, that uh, rightward shift in the demand curve shows up in the price, so the, the return to capital. Once you understand this, this is really, you, you almost understand everything that's there in the paper because everything else lo follows logically from this. You know, the fact that you know, here you're gonna have this, this increase in the return to wealth. Okay? Um, so in fact, okay, and, and you can show that basically there's a, yeah, so you have the simple um, uh, equation here for the equilibrium return where you can see the alpha shows up exactly there. And if P is equal to zero, then that effect isn't there. Okay. So, um, let me, okay, now I'm running a little low on time. Let me show you uh, uh, two more things um, and then go to the data. So the first thing is um, you can now think about sort of uh, when you have automation, um, what's gonna happen to, to uh, you know, the prices of productive factors um, in the economy and who are these productivity gains gonna accrue to. And basically the way this is gonna work is um, in, a representative Asian model where the return to wealth wouldn't move, okay? You'd always have that um, all the productivity, so this term here would be zero, all the productivity uh, gains in the economy would accrue to labor, okay? And in the long run, workers are always better off in a standard model, okay? In our model instead, some of the productivity gains are gonna accrue to owners of capital instead. Um, and in fact, that uh, effect may be so large that labor may actually lose on average um, from automation, okay? Which again, seems kind of intuitive, but in a, in a standard model, this effect isn't there at all, okay? 
Now, let me briefly uh, show you one more thing from the theory, which is, um, you know, what happens to the wealth distribution here. Essentially, in this type of a model, um, we have a very simple setup where people always accumulate um, according uh, to this term here. So something that de depends on the gap between the return to wealth and the discount rate. Um, and then they're hit by these dissipation shocks. This kind of uh, setup where people accumulate wealth through a process like this um, is well known to have, um, lead to a stationary distribution that is a Pareto distribution, okay? Um, and essentially all we're saying here is, uh, you know, let's, let's you know, work that out and see what the Pareto distribution is. And you get a very simple um, a characterization. In particular, you get that the distribution of wealth in this economy has a, a tail index, okay? And, you know, there's a little bit of algebra involved in there, but it has a tail index that's exactly equal to the capital share, okay? So whenever the capital share increases, then the fatness of the Pareto distribution um, increases. And the mechanism for this is exactly through the return to wealth, because basically people accumulate wealth as a, at a faster pace. Okay. Um, if it's okay, let me take like uh, one more uh, minute. Um, so, you know, we have this extended model where we add another asset, in particular, uh, you know, a risky and a safe asset, just so we can talk about this trend I showed you in the data between the diverging trend between um, uh, risky and safe rates. Um, and, you know, then, then, so that's useful for that, but let me skip that. And let me just show you basically um, what comes out of this model once you take it to the data. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm not gonna do it justice here in, in time. So essentially what we do here um, is we come up with some way of uh, measuring how much automation there is at different wealth percent, uh, income percentiles. Um, uh, and, and then we feed that into our model, okay? And then we try to see um, what it gives in terms of um, uh, changes in the overall income distribution over time. Okay, so in terms of the effect of, of labor incomes, that sort of we get by construction. Um, but then the interesting question is what happens to you know not just labor incomes but capital income and wealth inequality. Okay, let me just show you uh, this one graph and then sort of conclude. So this is sort of I, I guess you know the main graph that comes out of the model. Um, Essentially, uh, you know, look at the black line. Um, the, the, on the x-axis here is the income percentile. Um, on the y-axis is the model-generated change in um, uh, uh, income of these different uh, these different percentiles from one steady state to the next. And you can see, you know, there's a big, big uneven growth pattern with stagnation at the bottom and increasing incomes at the top. Where does this come from? I already said it in the introduction. At the bottom, it's all due to labor income. Um, these guys don't have any assets or very few assets, so they lose from automation. At the top, these guys win from automation. Why? Because they have a lot of uh, capital income and wealth. Okay. So let me, um, and this is something you can also kind of see in the data. Okay, let me conclude. So this was a tractable framework to think about this uneven growth that we've seen in the data. We've used it to study one particular uh, change, namely, um, you know, automation and, uh, you know, figured out its distributional effects. Um, importantly, not just on wages, but also on income and wealth distributions. The, the key new channel here uh, was that technology may affect returns and that may lead uh, to distributional effects. Um, you know, going forward, you can use this same structure because uh, it's nice and tractable to also think about other types of technical change, maybe, you know, changes in market structure. You can think about optimal taxation and so on. This is, we haven't done yet, may probably a separate project. Um, uh, but, you know, with the same type of project, uh, uh, you know, framework, you can kind of do something like that. Okay, sorry for going over time. I'll stop here uh, and thanks for listening. Thank you, Ben. So our discussant is Lohan Calve from EdHEC Business School. Thank you. Uh, you, see my, you see my screen, right? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, this is a, actually a very interesting paper. Uh, I really enjoy reading it. I learned a lot from it. Uh, so what I'll do is uh, first I go uh, over the model uh, and then I'll uh, present some suggestions for you know, improvements, future research and so on. Okay, so the idea of the paper is that if you look at the US since 1980, right? The aggregate economy has grown as a whole at a rate of 2%. 
but at the same time, incomes in a lower half of the distribution have stagnated, while at the top, incomes have doubled or tripled, depending on the uh, quantile you're looking at. And in addition, we know that wealth inequality has strongly increased. Now, what could be driving this joint set of facts? Well, automation has, uh, you know, has been proposed as previously as a possible explanation. There's a bunch of papers that, that make this point. Okay. Uh, so the paper is ambitious. It's very well written. It was actually, it was actually very straightforward to understand what's done, even though it's a, it's a technical and you know, highly sophisticated general equilibrium model. Uh, and what it does is that it links uh, the tasks to the distribute, so the, the, the tasks, right, that are performed in the, uh, in the economy to the distribution of both income and wealth. And I think that's the defining feature of this paper is that they look jointly at income and wealth. And that's a very interesting idea, okay? I've worked in, a little bit in this area and I know that, you know, there is this disconnect often between the two uh, aspects, income and wealth, and it's really good to be able to think about them jointly. So what they show is that automation generates uh, what I described before, wage stagnation for low-skilled workers, income growth for high-skilled workers, and higher returns on capital. And the calibrated version of the model captures key features of the data. So as I said, I'm going to go over the, the, the benchmark model, sort of explain its workings, then we'll talk about the extended model and the calibration results, and then I give ideas for future research. So the benchmark model is an infinite horizon continuous time economy uh, populated by a continuum of households that have infinite lives and that have isoelastic utility. Okay, so their uh, utility function is characterized by a time preference rate rho star and an elasticity of intertemporal substitution one of a sigma. Now, each household has a scale Z, and there are finitely uh, many scales. And everyone with scale Z receives wage WZ. And LZ denotes the fraction of the population with scale Z. Okay, so that's the key segmentation of the population of workers. Okay. Um, now, wealth accumulation is subject to dissipation shocks, and that's key, arriving at a constant rate P. Okay, so a household hit by such a shock immediately uh, consume all its wealth. So when you go from time T to time T plus DT with probably PDT, you get the dissipation shock. Okay, um, and there's an effect. So the effective uh, time preference rate becomes the initial one plus P. Uh, now, the households solve this optimization problem, right? So they, it's a actually what they're solving it turns out to be deterministic, despite the existence of the dissipation rate. Right? So they solve this problem, okay? And in fact, this is one of my points. I would have liked to see a little bit more discussion uh, of, uh, you know, the interaction between P and the, and the optimization problem. I saw there is some in the appendix, but it would be good to provide a little bit more intuition on, on this. Now, there is an aggregate technology, right? So essentially there's one big farm in this economy, as far as I understand. So there's, if you work in sector Z, right? Uh, you produce an intermediate output YZ, okay? So workers have these different skills and there's like little industries and in each industry, people produce the intermediate output YZ and then the aggregate output is uh, the a Cobb Douglas function of the intermediate outputs, where the, the uh, share of each sector, right, the shares add up to unity. Okay, so how are the, what is the technology used for uh, the uh, intermediate outputs? Uh, so here they use a, a model automation, uh, so which, which exists in the, in the literature as, as Ben explained in his presentation. So there is a there is you know in order to produce YZ you need to complete a, you know a continuum of tasks then indexed by U between zero and one, okay, and the intermediate output YZ is given by this equation, right? So you integrate between zero and one the log of the production of each task, right, uh, and then you you take the exponential and you get the the intermediate output YZ, okay. So now, how is the task, you know, what is the output corresponding to a task? Well, 
And this is where what's key here, if the task U is below some number alpha Z, right, then you can automate it. So you can, you know, produce YZ of U using capital. If U is above alpha Z, so if you're in a task, like a high level task that's above alpha Z, then you can only use labor to produce it, okay? So alpha Z is the uh, parameter that controls how, much, how easy it is, how possible it is to automate a task within uh, a sector, within sector Z, okay? Now, what is a general equilibrium? Well, in general equilibrium, uh, uh, production, the production process minimizes costs, households maximize utility. Uh, and then of course you have market clearing, so labor markets clear. So the integral of LZU is LZ in every sector. And then the aggregate capital supplied by household and used by firms is denoted by K and you know, all things, they're both equal, of course. So this is the aggregate, uh, uh, amount of capital that's, that's demanded by farm. So this is aggregate demand. On the other side, you have aggregate supply. This is coming out of the uh, household optimization problem. Okay, because it's all like a very nice model, you can very easily derive, you know, LZU, how much labor is allocated to a particular task, KZU, if it's a, a, high, a lower level task, how much capital you need to perform it. And then once you have LZU and KZU, you can obtain the intermediate output YZ without any difficulty. Okay. Uh, once you have the, the uh, intermediate output, right, produced by each sector, then you can aggregate up and you get the aggregate output. Okay, so the aggregate output, as Ben explained, is uh, a Cobb Douglas function of the aggregate capital K. Okay, and that comes out very naturally of this, of this uh, nice technology. Okay, where alpha is the average, uh, so alpha depends on the automation, right, key, that's key of the uh, of each sector, right? Alpha Z is the share of a sector that can be automated and it's weighted by, uh, by A to Z. Now, the wage is also, right, is given by a standard formula. The wage in sector Z is one minus alpha Z. So this is the, uh, the fraction of tasks that cannot be automated, right? Times Y and times a constant, okay? So essentially what's happening in the model is as alpha Z goes up, it means that within sector Z, right? You can automate more tasks, right? Then there are two effects. The direct effect is that the wage goes down, right? So the share of wealth created in the sector go, it goes less to wage to, to labor to uh, workers and more to capital, right? So that's a direct effect, negative effect of automation on wages. And then there is also the fact that when, as you automate more, the economy more becomes more productive, so output goes up, okay? So there is this tension between these two effects that explains why, in, you know, under some values of parameters and so on, you can get stagnant wages, higher, higher uh, I mean, output or growth uh, in the extended version and so forth, okay? From this equation, you can derive that the aggregate wage bill is one minus alpha times output. Okay, the fact the price of capital, right? So this is uh, how much you get when you land capital, but there's also depreciation rate. That's just alpha y over k, familiar formula. Okay, so what is the demand for capital from the farms? Well, it's so you get it from this equation. So it's kd. It's uh, alpha divided by r plus delta times y, just from this equation, okay? And then what is y? Well, you can substitute out y and replace it with uh, w bar divided by one minus alpha, okay? So that's what you get. So this is the demand for capital, okay? If you normalize the demand for capital by the aggregate wage bill, you get this equation, kd is alpha over one minus alpha times one over r plus delta, okay? Okay, so this is demand. What about supply? Uh, household optimality implies this familiar uh, accumulation equation, except for the fact that we have the destruction, right? You have the destruction of capital at rate P due to these dissipation shocks. Okay. So in a steady state, of course, the derivative is zero and you can express the supply of capital in this fashion. It's a function of rho, uh, the interest rate and so forth. What is very important for the model is that the interest rate is contained between rho and rho plus sigma p, 
right? So sigma is the inverse of the LCCC of substitution. P is the probability of destruction. And that, that's, that's what allows the model to have an upward sloping uh, supply as opposed to a horizontal supply, as is the case in a, in a representative agent model, or if you p is equal to zero. OK, so we've seen this graph. I think ben explained it very well. You have supply, you have demand at the steady state. Um, you know, this is the supply from, from, uh, from households. This is the demand by, by firms. If alpha goes up, there is an output shift in demand. The interest rate, I mean, the rate of return from capital goes up and the capital goes up. So you get both higher return on wealth and higher output. Okay, in, in the steady state. So I think this is a very clear, very elegant model. And then they look at the implication for LIBAM. So when a sector becomes more automated, then the steady state wage falls relative to other uh, sectors. And this is a direct, very simple implication of, uh, of this equality here, right? So if you take the ratio WZ over W when you compare two sectors, you just get essentially the ratio of the alphas, and so you get the result. Uh, what's a little bit more, what's a little bit more, you know, takes more work at least is to show that automation can decrease the average wage if uh, P is sufficiently high. That is, if so, automation can, you know, in, promotes, you would think, right, the accumulation of capital. But if capital gets destroyed sufficiently fast, overall, you know, uh, you see that automation has a negative impact on, on the average wage. Another uh, the, the nice, nice one of the nice features of the model is that it's a very modular model, a very modular paper in the sense that they take, you know, uh, the consumption portfolio problem, they take a technology with automation, and they also take, uh, and you know, they, you, through the dissipation rate, they also get you know, results that are familiar. Also, since Champagnon and you know Wald and Whittle, so since the fifties, we know that when you have a, a a wealth accumulation process with dissipation and with a, a strictly positive lower bound provided here by the by human capital, you know that you get paration tells. Okay. And so here you get, you know, that wealth and income have paration tell with exponent here, uh, zeta, and they characterize zeta. And this is known, as I said, from the 50s. You have to take the ratio of the household accumulation rate to the dissipation rate. Okay which in our case is, I mean, in the case of the paper, R star minus rho divided by sigma, that's the accumulation rate of, of wealth, divided by this dissipation rate. It's, very, it's actually quite straightforward to show this. Uh, you can just write down the stationarity of the CDFs. I, I you know, had fun just checking the, the formulas and you, know, you get this immediately, okay? So what it implies is that as alpha goes up, as you get more automation, right? R star, the rate of return on capital goes up, right? The other terms are constant, right? And as a result, you get uh, one of the zeta that's higher, which corresponds to thicker tails, right? The, the, the smaller the zeta, right? The thicker the tail, and that's exactly what you get. Okay, so this is a very beautiful and elegant model, I, I thought. Um, it's ingenious, it's pedagogical, uh, it's so, so it you combine like standard, uh, things. What I would simply, I would make two remarks. First, the dissipation rate is not so common in financial economics, uh, but the authors provide explanations, some explanations, but maybe at least from a finance perspective, more slightly more explanations might be useful. And I just also would like to mention that these are steady state comparisons based on so-called MIT shock. So like one time unexpected increase in, in automation, I guess in, a, in, a, you know, in an economy in which automation is a steady process, you know, there, there might be more, more going on. People might want to hedge, you know, their automation risk and so forth. So I think there's more that could be said. Um, let me talk briefly about the extended model. So uh, they have two assets, equity and, and a safe asset, uh, plus other uh, ingredients. Um, one thing is the stock price in the uh, extended model follows a process of the form RKDT plus new uh, DW. And RK is the mean after tax return per dollar of capital. W is meant to capture idiosyncratic risk. Okay. Um, and I'll come back to that. Uh, so investors have, you know, Duffy, Duffy Epstein's in preferences, and limited participation, and so on. So this is something I was not completely convinced about. It's the specification of the stock. 
I'll come back to it. Then they do some calibration. So the calibration is based on the formula. So there's they start from the capital share in 1980, which is 30.5 percent. They assume that it's also you know in every uh, in every um, sector, right? The share of uh, what can be automated is also 34.5 percent. And then they use this formula, uh, which you know allows them to relate. So in sorry, in 2014. Uh, the share of, uh, of capital is 42.8%. So this, these are like aggregate numbers. And they, they use this, a formula that allows them to impute the uh, share of automation in every sector. And what's the sector in the world? They actually subdivide the population in by you know, wage quantile. So by each percentile of the wage distribution is an actual sector. And so uh, and here, what's, what I haven't explained is that Omega RZ is the share of labor income derived from routine jobs in that particular percentile. So anyway, through this clever formula, they're able to calibrate the share of automated tasks in each uh, sector, right? In each quantile of the wage distribution, okay? Once they've done that, they can actually you know, look at the implications of the model. So they see that, uh, you know, that in, according to the model in most, uh, quantiles up to the 75th percentile at least you should expect a drop in the wage which is more or less consistent with what you see in the data perhaps not at the you know bottom, very bottom but and then above the 75th percentile the model and the data you know, show imply uh, an increase in in the in, in the wage so this is actually a very nice graph i wonder what could be driving the discrepancy here i was wondering if it had to do with the minimum wage or some other friction that you don't you don't capture. Um, then they look at the implications of the model for total income, defined as a sum of capital income and labor income. And what you see is that you know most of so this is a hockey stick type of graph. So you see that you know that the bottom, you know, the lower, like you know, the vast majority of the population, there's not much happening. And at the top, you have a big increase in capital income. So the, the people who gain the most from automation are indeed the people at the top. Okay, and really the very top, if you look at it, this is the top, you know, the 1% top, 0.5% and so forth. Um, they look at different data sets. So if you look IRS data, you don't find that capital income is so important. Uh, there's a bit of, there is an ambiguity because you, they don't, you know, you have to as allocate the income for S corporations and that, that's a subject for debate. But the RS data is not complete. If you use a more complete data, data, then you get much closer to, to the finding of the author. All right, so now let me, it's time for me to give you some comments. Um, so as I said, one thing I didn't like felt, feel very comfortable with was the definition of the stock return because my sense is that this, I mean, maybe I misunderstood what you're doing, but. I got the sense of the Brownian motion was basically, you know, unrelated to what was happening in the production sector. You just tagged on a, a, a Brownian motion. So one thing I'm going to try to do in my in this second half of the discussion is like provide input from a financial economics perspective, right? Since this is a, a finance seminar, I will try to give you my perspective um, and hope that it can be useful. So, okay, so not sure what this represents. Is it it's don't think it doesn't seem to be technological risk maybe it's discount rate risk or i don't know so if you focus on idiosyncratic production risk then there's of course there's uh, some other papers there's a uh, yeah, two papers i wrote with maris angeletos when he was uh, at, um, my student actually uh, when i was at harvard uh, so we look at the effect of idiosyncratic production risk um one thing which is very important in in finance is you know when there is a risk is it priced so you know, I'm not quite sure what the answer is, or is it, maybe it's not priced because it's orthogonal to everything else. Um, so I just wanted to suggest that um, we, are, I mean, I found the logic of the extended model a bit less intuitive because I wasn't couldn't quite wrap my head around what the this equity uh, 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 asset represents. But I just wanted to give you, I mean, it's, since I have the opportunity to give you like you know directions and so on. Uh, I just wanted to mention how we tend to do things in finance. So this is just an example, right? No, that don't claim that's not the only paper by far. But in this example, so in a paper with Sebastian Betemi and Avin Joe, what we do is we, we kind of start from the firm, right? 
So we write that the free cash flow is, uh, you know, one minus the tax rate times the earnings before interest and taxes, right? So, you know, we express this as a random variable, right? A n plus the n. So this is our shock, right? This is the shock to the free cash flow times, you know, times the volatility of cash flow times the capital stock plus the tax shield. So the point is, you know, we introduce the shocks through free cash flow or through the EBIT, right? Then we assume a tax yield. So we, we write that the debt is proportional to, to the to the at most, you know, it can be at most BN times the capital stock. And since there is a since there is a, a tax advantage, the debt in fact is equal to BN times KN, where BN is driven by collateralizability. Okay. But the point is we have introduced we have you know our shock from the you know at the firm level. Then we compute the value of equity. Uh, we compute the return. And so now we have a stock return that's tied to the shock that hits the firm. And I think this, if you did something along those lines, I think it would help us understand the role of, of equity in your in the paper. And you know, just to give a bit of advertisement, uh, then we're able to write, you know, the supply and the demand for capital of, of, of firm N. Um, and you know, if for instance you have a, 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 pro a profitability shock, so for instance, you know, the automation becomes possible, the firm becomes more profitable, then we get what you also obtain, right, in the sense that a shock to automation would increase uh, the rate of return, the average rate of return on capital, and would uh, would increase also the capital stock. So in some sense, there are kind of similar uh, logics here. Okay, and we can look at variation in supply, and we can also estimate, you know, the, the cost of capital and the and risk in the cross section of US firms. Okay, so just to say that this would be this was one point, uh, the definition of equity. There's another point which which caught my attention. Uh, um, and as I said, I really like the paper, but there are a couple of points that maybe could be improved. And one of them is you're you're very straightforward. You you state that uh, the, the the models transition dynamics are too slow to generate the fast changes in top inequality observed in the data. Okay. So in some sense, uh, and you, but it, so to some sense it means that you can only, I guess, look at relatively long run changes, right? And you're you're very like, clear about this, and you said that the Canada solution is to use uh, returns on wealth. So I wanted to mention that actually we know that this is working, right? So okay, so we you know we know that if you want to understand the dynamics of the wealth uh, distribution, returns are you know definitely a place to look. Uh, so in um, in the paper with Lowen back that you mentioned and Paolo Sodini, uh, we consider a very simple accumulation rule in which households just earn their historical portfolio returns and have homogeneous saving rates. In other words, you you know you observe because we have this nice Swedish data set. We know people have you know how much people have at the end of the year, right? You know the portfolio that they have at the end of the year at the end of year T. And if you just forgetting about saving, take a constant saving rate. If you just use the return that they earn on the assets that they had at the end of year T, you just apply the, the start the, the, the realized return between year T and year T plus one. Then essentially you, you, you can predict very well the, the distribution of wealth in year T plus one, right? So conditional knowing the distribution of wealth at year T. The portfolios of households at year t and the realized return between t and t plus one then you can actually capture very well the uh, distribution of the top share so returns are extremely important right just to illustrate this this is what you know this is what the, the black here black line is the prediction this is the observed change over a period of time this is uh, the annual change of the of the share of aggregate wealth held by the top one percent and you can see that you know if you know if you know returns portfolio returns you can basically figure out what the uh, the uh, top share is so this is very powerful and if you look at the top 0.01 percent of the population similarly if you know the returns you can basically uh, predict what the top share or figure out what the top share is okay so portfolio returns are very useful uh they have also properties that could help you also that could like uh uh, that might be worth incorporating in, a, in an extension of your work. Uh, so we know that there are wealth effects. We know that the return on wealth tend to increase with wealth. So that would also help to match 
uh, the variation in wealth inequality. This is a, a, an effect that was um, uh, conjectured by Thomas Piketty, but we show that it actually is there. Uh, there are life cycle effects also. So wealthier, older households tend to earn high returns. And I think that's, an, that's something important if you want to track the, uh, the, the distribution of wealth, especially at the top. There is also a paper that's, I think, closely related to what you do. It's a paper that has been around for a long time. Actually, I, have, I discussed it before the pandemic. Uh, it's a paper by Francisco Gomez, Thomas Janssen, and Nichan Karabulut. Uh, and essentially what they say is that uh, when there is uh, increased automation, when a worker is at risk of you know, being displaced by high, high automation, then they tend to rebalance their wealth away from stocks and more towards safe assets. Okay. And so as a result, they will, you know, uh, earn lower average returns. And so that would amplify, right, the, the uh, inequality effects of increased automation. So that's another channel, which I think might be something you might be uh, interested in. It, it's not a macro model, so it doesn't, these are complementary papers, but I think it's, this one is worth having a look at as well. Um, I'm almost done. So confounding factors. So, so, I mean, of course, there is a long list of theories of wealth inequality and income inequality. And I just gave a very like, uh, uh, sub, I was just giving a subset of this, uh, of the list of possible explanations. There's a paper on the cost of capital to entrepreneurs. There's a paper in the in the uh, CPR workshop on pension savings in response to low interest rates. So there's just a long list of explanation, changes in, to the product progressivity of the tax system and on and on. So one thing that, you know, that is fair to ask is, you know, is do you think automation is a key channel? How does it compare? What is the respective role of each of these channels? I think this is not for this paper, but that's something that might be interesting to 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 study in a in a follow following paper. So, in conclusion, I really enjoyed this paper. Uh, it's a thought provoking paper that uh, explains, I mean, explores the impact of increased automation on both the income and the wealth side. Um, and that's I think that's a very good innovation. Uh, so, you know, the results are clear: changing in automation can account for wage stagnation in most of the population and large income and wealth gains at the top. Uh, I think my, I guess my discussion focused on, on the uh, finance side of your model. And I think a model with more finance, so you maybe a better defined uh, risky asset, maybe with like elements from returns and household finance would actually make the, the model or its follow up even stronger. And of course I look, and I understand you're revising the paper. So I look forward to uh, reading the next version. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Loh. That was a very careful and detailed discussion. Uh, ben, would you like to respond briefly before we take questions? Absolutely. Yeah. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Laurent, for this uh, very thoughtful and, and super interesting discussion. Um, yeah, I just want to uh, respond very briefly to uh, three points or say something about three points. So the first one is um, this point, you just, your, your question, I guess, you know, what's that What's that DW, right? Like, what's the you know that idiosyncratic uh, uh, risk? And I guess um, I, I already put this in the chat. So this is indeed meant to capture um, idiosyncratic production risk, basically exactly like in your work with um, Mario's. Um, but I mean, you're correct that if that's the case, because it's a general equilibrium model, you know, strictly speaking, it should sort of we should spell out, you know where that shows up in, on the production side. We, we basically, I mean, we, we had some internal notes at some point where we spelled this out and, and we, we convinced ourselves that you can sort of do it, um, uh, but, but then we didn't put it in a paper, which I guess makes it a little hard to follow. But yeah, I, the, the idea is that these are kind of uh, somehow entrepreneurs and this is sort of idiosyncratic risk that they cannot uh, uh, ensure basically. And so that's why there's a, a risky asset. Um, the second point, um, just um, that's not so much a response, more uh, you know, an, an agreement, I guess. Um, it's about uh, Laurent's um, advertisement of this um, point that you know heterogeneity in, in rates of return uh, is super important and can help 
explain uh, a lot of things in particular with regard to wealth inequality dynamics. So, so yeah, I, wanted, I just wanted to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of this literature. I 100% I, I believe that's super important. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of, of your work in, in, in particular there. Um, and so the reason why we didn't put that in the model there, uh, at least in the benchmark model, is just because we wanted to have things nice and tractable. Um, and so what you need, right, to get it to work is you need some, uh, also, also the extended model, you know, doesn't have enough richness to, to do this, even though there is then a capital income risk. What you need is sort of different types, right? You know, some people always have a persistently higher return than others. Um, so some people are just better investors or better entrepreneurs. Then it kind of works in terms of giving you the quantitative wealth inequality dynamics. And that was just something that, you know, was too complicated or would have made the, the formulas less nice. But, you know, yeah, if you ask me, how, how, do you, how can you fix this model? That's exactly um, where I would go. Um, then the final thing, I mean, more, more also a point of agreement. Yeah, I think like this is on your very last slide where you said there's obviously lots of other you know, drivers of wealth inequality. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a, a, a cool paper to write would be sort of a, a horse race um, basically of different theories. So have, have like one big theory where you put in different potential drivers of wealth inequality, try to come up with some way to empirically discipline these and then see, you know, which one explains what fraction of the aggregate increase in wealth inequality. Um, this paper is obviously not that. This paper is sort of, you know, uh, focusing on one particular mechanism, trying to really come up with a clean theory of how that works and putting some suggestive numbers on this. Um, but yeah, like a, a follow-up project would be sort of to, to do it properly in a, in a bigger quantitative model, I think. Okay, that's all I wanna say, but yeah, thanks very much for, for a really great discussion. Thank Very you. good. Thank you, Ben. So we are ready for questions. Uh, the easiest thing will be if you unmute yourself and uh, ask questions. So Ulf, you can go first. Yeah, it, I didn't read the paper, so I probably missed exactly what's going on. I would, would also like to hear a bit more about this. How do they actually maximize these households? So I just want to understand also from a finance perspective, this this displacement thing that gives you this increasing um, supply, uh, is it just, do I understand correctly that this essentially is just a risk premium because you have to put more of your money into savings because capital is more productive and now you risk this displacement and you're risk averse with this, so you require a risk premium for that and therefore the expected return has to go up um, or is that uh, not how you understand it? I mean, if it is, then it's kind of like fair return on the extra risk you take, I guess. I guess the related question is, I don't really understand. It seems like it's idiosyncratic to the person. They lose all this. Um, but somehow it's, it's ID across all these people. So there's like, which is not how it works in finance either, right? Because then you should be able to diversify away this thing and you shouldn't have that risk premium. So, uh, and in fact, we know that risk premium have kind of gone down over time, I think. So, so right. those are basically the yeah. set of things I was puzzled by. Yeah. No, I wouldn't understand it as a risk premium. Um, okay. More like it's a, it's a steady state condition. So the, the way I think about it is it's, it's quite mechanical. So basically, People start with zero wealth, okay? Like they start their life um, or, you know, whenever they get wiped out, they, they start with zero wealth. You need, to, in, in a steady state, you wanna have some positive um, um, capital, okay? Um, the aggregate capital stock is just, you know, the, the average of, of uh, you know, individual's wealth in the cross section. So in order to have a positive capital stock, um, if people get sort of wiped out every now and then, it's got to be the case that people essentially accumulate wealth, um, you know, rather than just staying put where they are. So they have like a dot positive whenever they don't hit get hit by this shock. So then basically that return to wealth um, and the, the amount by which it exceeds the, the discount rate essentially is just enough to basically make people uh, 
accumulate um, and then uh, to balance this sort of destruction of capital. You know, so, so there, there was this graph, maybe let me uh, show it just briefly again. Um, so it's, uh, uh, This, this graph. So that's the wealth accumulation process essentially for people. So, you know, you're born, this is effective wealth, which is financial wealth plus human wealth. Um, but so you're born, so you're, you start basically with zero financial wealth, which means that your effective wealth is just your human wealth. Then you accumulate wealth according to this, and then you get wiped out, and then you start again with, with zero wealth. So the point is, in order for this to have a nice stationary equilibrium with positive capital, it's got to be that R is bigger than rho, essentially. Um, just because, you know, you have a bunch of people who, who, who get hit by these idiosyncratic dissipation shocks. Aggregate wealth is basically you integrate all, over all these guys in a cross section. Um, and so say R is were equal to rho, um, then, you know, that, that line wouldn't be upward sloping, would just be zero. And then everyone would just always stay at zero and you wouldn't have um, uh, you know, positive capital supply, and you wouldn't have equilibrium in the capital market, right? So you, uh, so so that's essentially. I mean, it's very, it's just very mechanical. <laughs> just, um, I guess it was an obvious in the household optimization problem how the P actually entered. Right? Like you have to care about this risk of getting wiped out, right? Right. And, I mean, there's so there's different ways of 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 thinking about it. Which I mean, in the paper we write down a bunch of different micro foundations. So maybe that makes it a little harder to follow because we're, we're, we're trying to be kind of a little bit general and saying, well, it could be either that or that or that or that. And I guess depending on which one it is, like, you know, it, it would want to make you think about it differently. So one way of thinking about it is, for example, um, sort of a perpetual youth thing, um, like, uh, like in a Blanchard-Yari model. Um, so it's essentially stochastic death. Um, um, and so, for example, there, then again, there's sort of two ways of doing it. One is you have some annuities where you can insure yourself against that, um, uh, essentially. That would be, uh, would give you sort of the same equations. Um, um, or you could also just think you cannot insure against it, but, you know, when you, just before you die, you know you're going to die and you're going to eat all your wealth. I mean, all of these are kind of obviously a bit extreme assumptions to keep things tractable. I mean, you know, not necessarily super clear what exactly the, you know, empirical counterpoint is. I mean, I, mean, I think that's fair, um, but essentially it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a stand-in, right? For other things that give you a non-degenerate wealth distribution and uh, uh, upward sloping capital supply, which- Okay, but, but it's something that they optimize over. They know it could happen and they optimize the utility subject to that shock. Actually, yeah, okay. 100%, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for example, um, in a in a Blanchard Yari type setup, right? Like, you know, when when, when you have annuities um, and you can insure against that risk, it basically just shows up like a higher effective discount rate, and it you know doesn't change anything else. Um, that, that's that's basically how this works. Um, yeah. But let me just finish the thought. So essentially, right? There's a standard class of macro models, um, uh, in particular heterogeneous Asian models like Ala Ayagari. Uh, and so on, that have all the same features um, of our model. In particular, they have a nice non-degenerate wealth distribution and they have an upward sloping capital supply. The issue with that type of models is um, you can only solve them on a computer. So they're uh, you know, not, not analytically tractable. So we wanted to have something essentially that functions basically like an Iagari model, um, but which you can solve with pencil and paper. And so that's that type of model basically, uh, uh, you know, does does the trick, and it comes at the cost of, you know, yeah. There's a little bit of tension. It's like, what exactly is this dissipation risk supposed to be? Any other questions? Yes, I, I would like to 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 ask, uh, how would this uh, general equilibrium would be affected by a uh, decrease in cost of uh, physical investment. You mean like uh, the, if, if capital say or investment had a price and that price were declining over time? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it would work basically like in a standard um, 
neoclassical model in terms of the aggregate. Okay, so you, I guess you'd get uh, a more capital accumulation, I guess. What I haven't thought about is um, what would happen to wealth inequality, which is, I guess, the, the interesting question. Um, I, I don't know off the to top of my head. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have to sp spell it. I mean, but it shouldn't be that hard to do, basically. I mean, what's nice about this, this model is that, you know, you have everything with pencil and paper and you can just, you know, add that to the equations and then do the comparative statics, right? And, and essentially, I'm pretty sure in that case, you should still be able to solve everything in closed form. And uh, I, I but, but I just haven't done it, basically. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of our time.